everyone, and welcome to the latest in the Geotox Express series. Delighted to have you here. Uh, delighted you could attend this morning. Delighted you were able to take some time out of your day to learn a little bit about some of the latest functionality that has been added to the Global Mapper LiDAR module. Version 22.1 was released a couple of weeks ago. Uh, last week we introduced the functionality that was added to the base product, the core functionality. Today, obviously focusing specifically on the LiDAR module tools that we have uh, enhanced within the, uh, within the LiDAR module. Uh, I am joined today, my name is David McKittrick, with apologies, David McKittrick, Outreach and, and Training Manager here at Blue Marble. Uh, today I'm joined by Jeff Hatzel. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, David. How are you this morning? I am great. Are you ready to play with some LiDAR tools? Yes, I am. Excellent, excellent. Well, before we get started, there's a few housekeeping issues that we need to cover. Um, those of you who have had attended our uh, presentations in the past will be familiar with this already, but you are in listen-only mode. You can hear myself, you can hear Jeff, you hopefully can see my screen as well. Uh, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Um, but we do want to encourage interaction. Um, if you have questions for us, and please ask those questions. Um, there is a questions panel over on the right side of your screen. You'll see a little tab there. You can pop that right out. And if you have questions about the content that we're going to be covering, please ask those questions uh, in that panel. We will try to answer those in real time, um, either verbally. I mean, Jeff and I will share the questions back and forth as we read them. Or they may be in written answers as well. If you have a, a more a detailed question, we may answer you in writing. Or if we don't get to your question, um, we will follow up after the presentation. We get a record of those questions that were asked. and We have your email address. Um, we will send you a, a direct response to any questions that you ask. So you will get an answer uh, to your questions. This session is being recorded, uh, so if you want to revisit some of the workflows, revisit some of the uh, procedures that we introduce or some of the tools that we, we, we talk about, um, you can uh, look at the recording. It will be on YouTube within a few days. As a registered attendee of this event, we'll, you'll get an email, a preliminary email, announcing its availability. And indeed, you can also access any of the previous presentations that we have delivered under the Geo, Geo Talks Express uh, sessions, um, last week's included, which is again the one what's new in Global Mapper, the base level what's new. A few things to mention before we get started. We have a number of additional sessions scheduled. Uh, typically, we're doing one a month for the foreseeable future. Um, this one that we're doing today is kind of a shoehorned in because we just had a release of Global Mapper. We decided to put a few extra ones, extra presentations in. But technically, the, the March presentation, which is coming up a week from today, we're going to shift our focus and look a little bit about, uh, look a little at our um, other application geographic calculator and specifically working with 3D coordinate systems in conjunction with Global Mapper. This is relevant uh, for the content that we're going to be talking about today. Obviously, we're, our focus today is primarily going to be point cloud data or LiDAR data. Uh, so managing that data, managing coordinate systems uh, uh, that are applied to that data is is um, a very applicable kind of follow-up, if you like. So registration is open for that session uh, this time next week. I believe it may be afternoon. I'm not sure, but it's certainly uh, uh, this day next week. Moving into April, we're going to come back to Global Mapper again, and we're going to talk about some of the online data sources. This is a component of the application that we refer to in passing, but it is worthwhile spending a little more time to explore some of those streamable data services that we offer. Some of them are very, very interesting. Uh, those of you who attended our session on bathymetric, uh, using bathymetric data in Global Mapper, we use some of those bathymetric data sets in that presentation. So we're going to explore that component further um, in our April session. Moving into May, we're going to take a look at some of the raster processing tools in Global Mapper. Uh, we'll explore things like image rectification, uh, raster calculation, et cetera, et cetera. So those of you interested in working with imagery or raster data in Global Mapper, uh, sign up for that session in May. And then registration is open for these. You can see the URL uh, at the bottom of the screen here. You can go to our website, put your name down, and you will get an email notification that you are registered for, uh, for those events. Speaking of registration, we are also uh, looking at our training schedule. We have another training session scheduled for towards the end of April. Um, we had a very successful session uh, this month. Uh, high demand for these online sessions. A lot of folks are interested in learning more about the capabilities of the software. This session in April, April 19th to the 23rd, uh, three hours per day. Um, we try to break this up into manageable chunks, if you like. And so we go for the full week. We go three hours per day. This session is an afternoon session, uh, a little bit more user-friendly for folks on the west coast of the US. Uh, those of you 
points east, um, Europe, etc. Maybe it's an evening session. Uh, certainly, you're welcome to, to sign up if you want to spend your evenings in a in a training class. Again, 19th to the 23rd for the Global Mapper class. We have a, a another class, a separate class for the LiDAR module the following week. And again, that's going to be an afternoon session, uh, two and a half hours per day for the three days covering the LiDAR module. Registration is open for those uh, sessions as well. Go ahead and go to the website and sign up for uh, for those classes. Which brings us up to today. And again, our focus today is going to be specifically on the new tools that were added to the latest release of the LiDAR module. Well, we're going to begin by answering the question, what exactly is the LiDAR module? In fact, before we even get to that, to answering that question, we're going to ask you a question because we know there are people who come to these sessions who have uh, have not used our software. So we want to find out if you're out there. We want to find out what level of experience you have or you know what tools you've used specifically in this case we want to know if you're using the LiDAR module um, for those who are not we want to begin this session by answering that question what is the LiDAR module um, I'm going to hand over to Jeff to talk he's going to talk a little bit about some of the recent updates now obviously this is a kind of an ongoing development process Google Mapper is continually in a state of development um, if we look over our shoulders briefly there's been a lot of very interesting tools that have been added uh, recently we want to make sure you're aware of those especially for those of you who are still maybe using an older version um, specific to the version 22.1 release we want to take a look at some uh, updates and enhancements that have been added um, I'm going to take a look at the building extraction tool um, when you work with LiDAR data uh, there, you can kind of segment that into two kind of distinct sections there are those using LiDAR data that are primarily interested in terrain analysis um, there are those for whom LiDAR data becomes a resource to extract vector features and this tool addresses that type of use where you're looking at the point cloud and deriving vector vector uh, uh, features. And we're going to take a look at that tool and the improvements that have been made in building extraction. Moving to the other side, where we, we use LiDAR for terrain, for surface generation, uh, Jeff is going to take a look at some of the new options that have been added in our terrain painting tool. Now, terrain painting uh, was added with the release of version 22.0 as a way to um, modify the terrain based on a drawing process. I'm not going to steal your thunder here, Jeff. I know you're going to show us this a little bit later, but it's a really powerful tool for modifying the terrain dynamically. And we'll take a look at some of the new options that have been added into that uh, that tool. Pixels to points is a very powerful component of the LiDAR module for photogrammetric point cloud generation. Um, again, this is a component that's been continually updated. I want to introduce you to some of the new uh, functions that have been added for version 22.1. Um, this function the 3D view saving is not specific to the LiDAR module, but definitely has relevance. Uh, Jeff is going to show us some ways that you can uh, specify what view to, to assign when looking with po at point cloud data, and also to save a custom view. Uh, those of you who attended last week's presentation will have already seen this in a different context, but we'll obviously bring it up uh, when working with LiDAR data. A few other things in here, we have some new settings available. Uh, default uh, settings can be applied uh, when loading point cloud data. I have a much more here. Time dependent, if we have some time, we may expand on some of these themes to introduce some of the other new tools that have been added. So my first question as noted here is what is a LiDAR module? And as I mentioned before, um, this is going to be specifically directed to those of you who are perhaps new to the module. So again, as, as noted, we're gonna ask you a question. Um, you should see on your screen a question, which version, or sorry, the question is, do you currently use the LiDAR module? And if you do, you'll note a few options there to determine or to, to specify which version of the LiDAR module. Um, I'm gonna give you just a few seconds to respond you can just simply click or if you make the wrong selection you can click again and it will reset and when we're done we can uh, close the close the poll and then share the results with you so you know who you're spending the day with today interesting results coming in here uh, interesting to see that most of the the most common response so far has been number the final option there that you're not using the lidar module well, i'm glad i'm glad we actually are going to spending today uh introducing some of those key tools for 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 you folks so just a few more seconds and we will go ahead and close that poll and if the techn technical component works as expected i'll share the results with you and you should be seeing those results on your screen. Now, as you'll see, again, 
a third of you uh, here today are not actually using the module. Um, I'm going to show you, we're going to go through a quick slide as noted to highlight or outline exactly what this is. I also want to show you where you can activate the module. If you want to try it out for yourself, you're using Global Mapper, but without the lighter module, you can initiate the trial process to, uh, to evaluate this, maybe to work with some point cloud data. So thank you for responding to the poll. Interesting answers there, Jeff. That was a little unexpected. Uh, that high yeah, percentage. I certainly didn't expect that at all. Yeah, and a lot of you have uh, jumped on board with the latest version as well. Glad to see that. But those of you who, who are not using the module, great to have you with us. Um, so let's answer that question. Let's answer the first question. What exactly is the LiDAR module? Well, it's worth noting it's an optional add-on to the software. If you are using Global Mapper, you can enhance the functionality by activating this, this additional component. Now, it is referred to as the LiDAR module. I should stress, as you will see today, it goes beyond LiDAR. There are additional tools that it provides. Jeff is going to show us one of those, which is for terrain painting. Um, it also works with more than just LiDAR. It works with any type of point cloud data, uh, and it provides uh, as we note here, powerful point cloud processing functionality. It includes a number of uh, tools for editing, filtering, and what I've referred to here is um, uh, LiDAR improvement tools. You can update the quality of your LiDAR. Um, applying an offset to the z-value to, to make it match ground better. You can apply classifications that were not in the original data. So there's numerous tools that will allow you to improve the quality of your data. Um, I mentioned this at the start. It does include tools for initially reclassification and ultimately extracting features from your point cloud. I'm going to show you an example of this in just a few minutes where we can see points that are appropriately classified or to which the classifications have been assigned. We can generate vector features. That's a very powerful component of this tool. Um, also, as I noted before, it does include right out of the box, it includes this the pixels to points tool. If you have a drone and you're collecting imagery, you will really Really want to take a look at this because it allows you to generate 3D data sets, point cloud data, mesh or model data, um, as well as ortho imagery from simple top-down drone collected images. And again, a little bit later in our session, I'm going to show you the enhancements to this tool, but also provide a little context by showing you exactly what it does. And once again, we have much more in here. We have a lot more functionality uh, that's in the module. Very quickly, I'm going to switch to the application itself. This is the latest build of Global Mapper. I want to show you, for those of you who are not using the module currently, how you can activate it. I'm up here in the help menu right at the top of my screen. Um, just over halfway down, you'll see License Manager. Now, if you do not have the LiDAR module activated, the box that you see indicated where my cursor is located will not be checked. You can check this box. It will prompt you to license or register, and you can request a trial. Uh, just like you can try the software itself, you can also request a trial of the module and see uh, maybe following up on, on some of our, our uh, the tools we introduced today, see if it works for you for your point cloud processing. So again, that is definitely an option um, to initiate that trial process if you're one of the 34% uh, of the folks in the presentation who are not currently using the module. So the next bullet on my slide is a, a recap of some of the recent module enhancements. Now we're just going to go through this very quickly. Jeff, I'm going to hand over the screen to you and maybe you could give us a, a quick guided tour through some of the sure. stuff that's been added recently here. You should be seeing yeah, Jeff's absolutely. screen in just a second here. So we will take a look at uh, just a few new features uh, associated with the LiDAR module. All of this should be, you know, as recent as version 22. So nothing that um, is too old, all within the last six to eight months. So we're looking at just a, a DTM here that I created from some loaded LiDAR. Uh, the reason I want to start with the DTM here is to highlight one of our newest tools as part of the LiDAR module called Terrain Painting. And David hinted at that a little earlier. Uh, what this tool allows us to do is interactively and dynamically edit uh, elevation values of a gridded terrain layer. So this, you know, this is feedback we had had from customers for a long time um, as we work to build this into the tool. And we're going to dive into it a little bit later on. But what it allows us to do is, uh, you know, do things like fill gaps. So maybe my source LiDAR has some holes in it or whatever my terrain data set may be has some holes, I can fill those gaps. 
I can do some some basic analysis such as smoothing terrain or you know dynamically raising and lowering the elevation of a certain region. This can all be done based on drawing points, lines, or areas. And we'll look later on at some of the newer and more advanced uh, operations here, such as specifying slopes either along or across a line feature. So some great ways to dynamically edit our existing terrain data sets. So let's take a look. This happens to be the source LIDAR for um, that terrain data set. There have been um, recently a variety of updates to our LIDAR classification tools. So first thing we'll do is we'll just take a look at our LIDAR by classification. So this data set's already been classified. Um, we can see our buildings, trees, grounds. Um, I made our bridges a bright pink just because I want them to stand out later on. So we can see our bridges, water, all of that. What I'd like to highlight here is with the release of version 22, we updated some of our classification tools. And so for those of you who have been using Global Mapper for a while, you're probably familiar with what we call the gridded method that's open on my screen now in the classification tool. Uh, this is still available and is essentially, um, you know, when we run a classification of this nature, it's based on the elevation characteristics of the point cloud that we're supplying, uh, looking for planarity within the point cloud to find, you know, planar building features um, or maybe features we, we suspect to be trees. The newer method uh, is called the segmentation method. And the reason that we developed this is because we wanted to provide more comprehensive support for all types of point clouds. You know, in the early days of LIDAR, everything was uh, predominantly gathered from fixed wing aircraft. And so that's what the initial um, classification methods reflected. But now we see, we're seeing LIDAR sources from uh, UAVs, helicopters, terrestrial sources, uh, photo generated point clouds as well. And so we wanted to be able to better classify and work with uh, all of those different point cloud sources. So these segmentation methods essentially um, run some more advanced statistics on the point clouds. So in this case, points are groups based on how similar they are to each other within local neighborhoods. And if you want to think about that a little bit more advanced, for those of you who are more statistically inclined, uh, essentially, we're running a principal component analysis um, on clustered points. We're trying to uh, identify given objects or features, in this case, buildings or trees. Uh, David, actually, after I'm done re recapping this, David's going to show us uh, the implications of what happens after that classification um, with some new feature extraction updates. So definitely worth looking into if you're one of our uh, classification users within the ladder module. Uh, Jeff, just, sorry to interrupt. The question just came in specific to, to what you've just shown us. Do you, yes. The question is, do you have certain sets of standard parameters for automatic point cloud classifications? I think the simple answer yeah. to that is no. There is, there is no right or wrong in this procedure uh, because of the number of variables that we have at play here, the point density, yeah. the nature of the, the, the uh, structures that you're trying to identify. Um, mm -hmm. There are defaults. You'll notice. You'll have noticed in the dialog box that Jeff just showed us that, that you, it's a good idea to start with those default values. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, sometimes it's a good good idea just to identify a specific area where you know what the results should be. You know where the mm -hmm. building should be, and and determine what the settings are based on the results you see there. Um, yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah, but there, there, again, there is. There are people often ask, what are the correct settings for this? There, mm -hmm. there are no correct settings. No. It is, it is a variable tool, obviously. Um, right. While I have the mic here, there are a couple of other uh, questions that have come in in this regard. Somebody had mentioned about uh, the LiDAR data is in meters. Can we uh, convert it? Yes, you can. And there's, there's no, no, a number of options for updating your point cloud data, including changing the units that are applied to the elevation value. So, uh, I'll, Jeff, you don't have to show up, but when I grab the screen in a few minutes mm -hmm. here, I'll show you that tool. Sure. Um, Will the classification tool work with non-LIDAR data such as bathymetry? Absolutely. I mean, this is a geometric analysis effectively here. So you're looking at the geometric characteristics. Now, with bathymetric data, it's not likely you'll be interested in looking at buildings. Um, but in terms of at least identifying a surface, um, those points that represent the seabed, for instance, mm -hmm. would, would be extract would be identified using our ground classification. So yes. Um, 
so again, keep those questions coming in and we'll answer them uh, as we can during the presentation. Yes, yeah, sure. So we uh, right now I have my LiDAR displayed visually. We're looking at it by classification. Uh, we recently added some new display options so that we can pull from different information from our point cloud and, and base our display on that. Uh, one of the simple ones is our source layer. So now if I have multiple layers of LiDAR and I want to see uh, one layer versus the other, right? I have two layers loaded. So one of them is colored blue, the other colored red, just so I can very easily distinguish between those two layers. Perhaps a bit more advanced is displaying LiDAR um, that now can be done by scan angle. So if your LiDAR data has a scan angle attribute, you'll be able to display based on that scan angle. So we'll see here now where, uh, you know, along the flight line where our, our points were recorded relatively beneath the aircraft versus, uh, you know, farther away as those values increase. Looks like here we probably have some overlap in our flights, um, but some new display options as well. Uh, and that carries over to 3D view also. So let's take a look here in 3D. Let me let's zoom into a good perspective here. How about something like this? So within 3D view, we now have um, some new display settings that I am a very big fan of, as I often tell a lot of my colleagues. And this is called eye dome lighting. Um, it doesn't apply strictly to LiDAR, but it's a great tool when visually analyzing our LiDAR. This is an enhanced uh, light technique, so it stands for, or it's often called EDL for eye dome lighting. Uh, what it allows us to do is highlight the depth and the edges of features in order to better identify objects visually. So essentially it'll help um, make things pop and help specific features stand out. Uh, I remember when we were first looking at this with some sample user data, it was of a, of a hay field. And without eye dome lighting, it just looked like your standard flat field. As soon as we turn on that eye dome lighting, though, um, we can begin to see hay bales and other detailed structures. So in this case, we're going to turn on our eye dome lighting. And normally this is on by default and I would leave it on. But so I'm going to enable my eye dome lighting and I have it set a little bit exaggerated so we can see the detail. But keep a look for the change, you know, maybe along the bridge here, along the power lines, um, or, or in some of our building structures. And just notice how the display of this data changes, especially as we get away from the foreground and the midground and background of our data set. So we'll see that our data pops much more, right? We've, we've helped to exaggerate the, the styling of the points, some of the lighting and shadowing effects. So features that were previously you know, much smaller things like the detail on the top of the bridge, our power lines. You know, if I take a little bit of an oblique angle, you know, these power lines are not very dense in terms of point features, um, but they stand out much more clearly with the eye dome lighting. Uh, oh, look at this. I bet all of these little shrubs and trees through here, I bet with a standard view, I bet we won't see those, right? So this area looks much flatter without that lighting, with that eye dome lighting enabled, I can see much more detail within my point cloud. Um, again, just a visual, um, but a great way to enhance, you know, what we're looking at in 3D. Um, and this will apply to, to terrain data as well. Last thing we'll look at in 3D that is relatively new before I hand back over to David. Um, so 3D view for a while now has had the ability to manually select points. Uh, what's newer though is the ability to sweep select. So as I might do in 2D view, in 3D view, I can click and drag to select points. Uh, let's go ahead. Maybe we're interested in the top portion of this structure here. It looks like maybe a parking garage. And I'm, I'm interested in selecting these points. Using my digitizer tool, just like I would in 2D view, I can click and drag over the points that I want to select. Now, a couple things here. First, the points are selected. You'll also notice that the selected points remain their default color, and I've set everything else that's not selected uh, to be a bit darker. You can fool with these settings and determine you know, what darkness you want, or maybe you don't want any at all. So you can you know, change how dark those unselected points get, brighten things up a bit if you want. I personally like to keep the data that I am not selecting very um, dark or, or opaque so that I'm really focused on uh, the data that I've selected. That selection carries over to 2D view, 
let's look at this with a different color scheme. And so we'll see now those here are those selected points as well. Uh, David, I'll send it back to you now so we can um, maybe take a look at some some newer things in the LiDAR module. Absolutely, yeah. The inter that in last tool is very interesting. Um, Jeff, you didn't actually, yeah, I mean, if you do a broad sweep select, it's mm -hmm. very interesting to look at the corresponding selection in your um, your 2D view because it appears like a cone, where, where in the 3D view will appear like a rectangular selection. In the 2D view, you're kind of extending out to the horizon basically so a lot of a lot of interesting applications for that also very useful when you have that selection mode enabled because it does retain the points with their default display characteristic it just mutes the colors so you're not kind of losing context but you are able to specify or a single in or focus in on just the points you're interested in in, in visualizing so a lot of useful yeah. tools are yeah. and again those are not new for 22.1 we're kind of long way into our presentation we haven't even talked about what's new yet but they're worthwhile noting because a lot of you are still using older versions those are some of the enhancements that have been applied recently now what i want to take a look at in our next little segment here is the building extraction function and if effectively carries on from where Jeff left off. I'm going to bring up an instance of Google Mapper here. And this is data we've looked at before. Those of you who know where we are geographically, this is the state of Maine. In fact, this particular data set is an area of suburban Portland, Maine. And you can see with this display, you can see some rectangular features. Those are buildings. Uh, what we're going to do in this exercise is effectively extract those. We're going to uh, create uh, vector polygons, 3D vector polygons corresponding with those building outlines. Now, in order for this to work, um, the points need to be classified. And the procedure actually requires you to initially identify ground points as the basis for identifying known ground points, which includes our buildings. Now, we've already done this. This follows uh, a the component that Jeff showed us, which is the, build, the classification of which you noted we have a recent upgrade. But I'm going to visualize this data by classification, and you'll see these orange points. Now, I have to note here that this data is relatively low resolution, maybe a couple of points per square meter at the most, but it gives us a good illustration of the improvement that's been applied to this tool. My objective is to create polygons with this level of point density. If I use the original algorithm that was applied, it creates a fairly serrated outline. I'm actually going to go do that first so you can see the results. And then I'll show you the improvement that's made. Now, we've actually applied two improvements. Uh, one that was there previously is a simplification tool to simplify the lines, the outlines. The What's been added for version 22.1 is a regularized tool that enforces right angles, parallel, and perpendicular lines, basically ensuring that your buildings adhere to a normal outline, a rectangular outline. Now that may or not may not be the case in the real world, so you may need to adjust your settings a little bit. But in the case of what the buildings we're seeing here, they're fairly uniform rectangular, and our objective again is to create uh, rectangular features. Before I go to the workflow, just in response to the question that was asked previously about uh, the unit of measure that's applied, the, the unit of measure that's embedded in the data will be what Global Mapper reads, but you can change that. If I double click on this uh, layer, you'll notice elevation unit drop down is right here you can make that whatever you want and proceed with whatever uh, analysis you need beyond that so that is definitely an option that can be applied okay so let's get to the extraction process now this is one of the tools in the in the lighter module toolbar uh, along with the automatic classification tools we have this extract vector features and this one dialog box actually allows you to perform multiple types of extraction based on the presence of certain point types uh, quickly looking at some of the alternative workflows trees if you have vegetation points identified the green points in my case I can derive trees, individual trees, where the tree has a height, it has a spread, and you can actually model those as 3D trees in the 3D viewer. We'll leave that one for another day. We also have a couple of variations on power line or, or utility extraction, power lines and power poles. In Jeff's example, we saw those linear patterns of our points. We could actually use this tool to generate 3D lines. Um, so a few variations on the theme of extraction, but what we're specifically going to look at is probably the most common, which is our building extraction. Now, I have a few settings applied from the last time I used this. I'm going to keep this fairly simple to begin with. I'm not going to, to uh, apply any type of geometric uh, modification. I'm going to go with the raw data and you'll see the results. Effectively, this is a before and after. We're going to show the before and then we'll show uh, what we are able to do with the current build. By the way, one of the settings I like to apply in this, if you're using this yourself, 
is a filter based on the number of points that identifies as part of a, a specific plane, the plane being the roof of the building. Um, you set this fairly high, it will ensure that those small clusters of buildings that maybe are recognized as a, as a truck going along the highway or something that's relatively flat that's not a building, those will be ignored. So you can play with this value to ensure that what you're getting are just buildings, and this is a point count. You can also do that based on a square uh, a surface area as well. Footprint area can be defined as well. Um, I'll just go ahead and click OK with this and hopefully we will see our output layer in just a few seconds. My, again, my objective is to create some polygons. I'm going to turn off the point cloud and you'll see the results. Now again, I should stress, this is the way it used to be. And this was always quite frustrating for me. It's like, oh, why can't you do this better? Well, this is doing exactly what we asked it to do. It's literally connecting the dots along the edge of the, the buildings, those orange points, and creating polygons. So it, it does what it says on the tin, as the saying goes. Um, thankfully, we have updated that now, and there's been a few modifications that have been applied to make this a lot more powerful. The first of those is an option to simplify. Now, simplification, it's not new for the current version, we just, again, quick recap, will allow me to um, simplify the actual lines themselves. If I actually turned on the vertices for those initial outlines, they are very serrated. There's a lot of vertices in there. What we can do here, based on this horizontal threshold, is have Global Mapper move those vertices so that they align themselves. And this point spacing is a multiple of the spacing of the, the points in the data. It will, up to that level, move points so that they adhere to a single straight line. And I'll go through this second scenario so you can see it's a slight improvement over what we saw before. Again, we'll wait for this to complete. I'll turn off my point cloud, and that looks a little bit better. We're starting to see more straight lines, but still, these buildings that we know are rectangular are still adhering quite uh, uh, specifically to the outline of where the points reside. It's not a perfect outline of the building yet. What we've added with the latest build is this regularize option. Oh, I forgot to turn my point cloud on. Let me try that one more time. I'll turn on the the point cloud, we'll go back into extraction again. Uh, I'm gonna disable simplification. I'm gonna enable this regularize. Now regularize, as I mentioned at the start, enforces right angles where it detects uh, a, a, a approximate right angle turn, it will make that a right angle where it detects in a given plane, uh, the edges which are almost parallel, it'll enforce them to be parallel. It'll enforce perpendicular and parallel lines. And it does so again up to a defined threshold. I was asked this question a couple of weeks ago in training. What is the best setting for this? Trial and error. Look at your data. See what works. Certainly with the lower resolution data such as that I'm working, I may want to increase this threshold. Allowing Global Mapper to move the points around a little bit more to ensure I'm getting nice rectangular features. And again, the point threshold can be defined as well. Looking at some of these clusterings of orange points, I don't believe these are buildings. And I can eliminate those from consideration by defining how many points I need. Now, my fingers are crossed to see if this actually works. We'll click OK. And I'm gonna have three versions of the same layer. Now you can see we have really nice, clean, rectangular features. Basically, we've defined the building footprints from uh, the point, from the classified points in our point cloud. To wrap this up, I want to show you one more thing, which a couple of checkboxes that I had previously unchecked. This is not new for the current version, but uh, an enhancement, I think it was added for version 21.1. Jeff, you might want to correct me on that. I know we've had this for a few generations, uh, but it's the ability not only to define the footprint of our building, but also the roof planes and the sidewalls. You basically reconstruct the geometric characteristics of each building by not just making a flat top-down surface, but by defining specifically those roof planes. And those can be pitched roofs, they can be um, domed roofs, they can be uh, you know, uh, uh, angled roofs in whatever way. So we're basically defining three different uh, uh, geometric variables, the footprints, the planes, and the walls. I'll just use the settings as they were previously. Once again, I forgot to turn my point cloud on. Try that one more time. And with those settings retained, sidewalls and, and uh, planes, we'll click OK one more time, because with these Roof components now available, again, turning off the point cloud. I'll give us a little bit of a context here by turning on some imagery, it's a low resolution base map here. And I also have some terrain so we can actually uh, give ourselves a surface uh, on which to view this data. If I pop up my 3D view now, kind of 
the ooh and ah feature, we can now see what we were able to generate as part of that process. It's quite hard to see, but this is actually a little bit of a, a pitched roof here. We're seeing the two segments uh, of that roof. Uh, and again, I can isolate individual components, the turning off, that's the footprints, that's the walls, and that's the roof. We can even see the walls by themselves. So effectively, you can generate an outline of the building by just looking at the wall. So a much improved tool. Uh, for especially when you're working with data that's perhaps not quite uh, as high a resolution as 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 uh, you would like in terms of uh, of the outline of these buildings, you can uh, force Global Mapper to respect the fact that these are right angle buildings. Any questions come in on that one, Jeff? Uh, a few did. I realized I just answered them privately, so let me throw a couple your way. Um, somebody asked about detail for extraction, uh, specifically curbs and gutters. Uh, um, yeah, the, the tool I, sh I use, obviously, is specifically for buildings. Yes. Um, extracting curbs is an interesting one you should ask because there is another tool in Global Mapper that we have used for that specific workflow, and it's, it's effectively a 3D digitizing tool where you trace the edge of the curb using a series of perpendicular profiles. Some of our previous presentations on the LiDAR module have, have demonstrated that tool, but this tool that I showed you will not automatically identify those curbs and gutters. Uh, someone also asked, I'm just noting the questions here myself, someone also asked, are they vectors? Yes. What I generated are vector features. They could be exported uh, in any of the supported uh, vector formats. So yeah, great question. And somebody asked another know. question about bathymetric data. Um, so it's worth noting that if your data is in any you know, point text format, it can be loaded and handled as LiDAR. Um, Global Mapper doesn't necessarily quote unquote care what, where it came from, but you can load it and handle it uh, as LiDAR data. Uh, is it possible for powerline poles? Yes, there is an extraction tool for powerline poles. Initially, uh, a classification to identify poles. Those poles would be effectively extruded cylindrical objects. That's your pole. It uh, doesn't have to be a specific, specifically a power pole. It could be a flagpole. And it will identify those points that correspond with that pole. And as an output, as an extracted feature, it will actually extract a point. Uh, indicating the height of that pole. So yes, power pole identification, reclassification and extraction is also supported. Moving on, Jeff, you introduced us briefly a few minutes ago to the terrain painting tool. Um, there have been some enhancements made to that function and I believe you're gonna take a look at some of those tools right now. Yes, David, did my screen come through properly there? I'm not seeing it yet. Let's see. Can you, uh, would you mind resending the screen request? It, uh, sure, let me grab the screen. Here again. Yeah. Okay, you're seeing me again, hopefully. Let's try that one more time. There we go. Okay. There we go. See it now. Okay, so as I was speaking to earlier with terrain painting, um, terrain painting came around in version 22. Uh, it allows us to live edit of values in a terrain layer. So we'll look at some of the initial simple functionality, and then we're gonna look at some of the new, um, kind of more advanced functionality as part of this tool. So we're looking at a terrain data set here that I created from LiDAR. Um, and uh, what we're gonna do is begin to manipulate this a little bit using our terrain painting tool. First thing I want to look at is one of the uh, very initial functionalities as part of this tool. And what I want to do in this case is specifically uh, set the height uh, of my terrain to a given elevation. So I'm going to choose the option here to set my terrain height. Uh, and in this case, you know, I'm modeling a, a site plan for construction. And so I want to outline that area and say, I need this site leveled to a certain elevation. Now, when we're in the terrain painting tool, we can do things based on points, lines, or area features. You'll notice this trace mode option. I'll show that later probably. Um, trace mode is clicking and dragging with my mouse. That's uh, also, I believe, new for 22.1. I don't always have a steady enough hand though, so we're gonna, we're gonna use vertex mode right now. Uh, I'm gonna specify the height of my feature. I want to be about 250 meters and my feathering, so that's feathering the edge of my flattened area. I'm gonna leave that, or actually that's already set to three um, pixels or three grid cells. 
So my, my site plan of interest, let's zoom into this a little bit. So I'm gonna flatten this, this site plan. You know, Very often when we um, are creating a DTM and I've removed things like buildings from my LiDAR, um, I might not get a perfectly flattened site in my model, uh, you know, just given the nature of holes in LiDAR and in interpolating across that. But with the terrain painting tool, I can outline my area, and maybe we'll try to get a little closer, and very easily and quickly flatten it. So now we'll see if you look at my cursor information on the lower left-hand side of my screen, um, the elevation here is an even 250 meters, just like I had specified. I can always, as long as I have my terrain painting window open, I can undo anything I've done, or perhaps you know redo it if I if I want to to reapply the changes that I have just made. Uh, it's worth noting, as with anything in Global Mapper, this won't be completely permanent till this file until you export it out of the application. So always always keep that in the back of your mind. Jeff, quick, quick question come in, uh, relative, re or relevant, I'm sorry, to what you just showed us. The question was, is the height in terrain painting relative or absolute? And I guess the easy way to answer that question is both. <laughs> you can do either. Uh, there is, if you note on the dialog box, set terrain height, that is absolute. What you set is hard-coded, and that's above sea level. Um, above, uh, there's also an option there, you'll notice, a raise height. That would obviously be relative. Now, if Jeff had used that option, mm -hmm. the surface would still retain its structure, its characteristics, its texture, but it would just raise the Z level. So I don't think that would be appropriate in this case to raise the height, rather than it'd be more appropriate to define the height by setting that height. So the answer to the question is both relative and absolute, depending on your use case. Yep, good question. Um, sort of going off of that, so let's say um, I need to just to smooth out an area. I don't necessarily need a, a completely flat area like I just made here, but let's say for, for argument's sake, um, you know, for a visual final product, uh, I need to clean up this riverbed. And this could, could be anywhere on, on your terrain data set, right? But we've interpolated across some of the water here, you know, LiDAR, we don't get great, great um, returns from the water. And so I want to smooth this out a little bit, um, but I don't want to maybe artificially flatten it. Using my smooth tool, I can essentially average a region. So in this case, we're looking at about a, a nine square pixel region. And so as I draw, the, the elevation in that area is going to be averaged. So I'm just gonna draw a little quickly here. Um, this would probably be a great example. I should be showing trace mode, um, but I'll just place a couple vertices as I draw along my, um, my riverbed here. And we'll see that the elevations in this area are averaged out. They get much smoother and much more, um, in this case, say pleasing to the eye, easier to, to look at, whatever, whatever our next our next step may be um, in that process. I saw somebody ask um, about a ditch. You know, you could you could be modeling anything here. Um, a ditch perhaps might be appropriate. We'll look a little later, actually um, sloping along and across line. So I'm not going to make a ditch, I'm going to make a, a berm, but the exact same idea will apply. So we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. But let's start looking at one of the newer tools here. So I intentionally left the bridges out of my data set when I created my terrain service, but you can imagine you know, there's quite a few bridges here. Um, let's say for argument's sake though, I am modeling a new bridge across the river. And the, the previous bridge, you know, it, uh, connected right across here, but maybe in this this new construction of the bridge, we want to merge into the high point on the terrain and down through the road network here. So I'm going to use one of the the new operations in terrain painting called uh, slope along a line. Now, what I'm going to define as options for that is essentially the size of my brush or the number of of pixels I'm going to be adjusting as I, as I draw my line. Um, my feathering, again, is the, the edge of that feature. So from the edge of those pixels that I've edited, how am I feathering that into the new data? And then what type of slope do I want associated with my line? So in this case, we're gonna make a relatively um, flat so sloped feature. And I'm going connect to connect from where the current road ends and across to where we are proposing the new bridge to go. We'll see now, 
we have a, a new terrain feature here. If I look at it as part of my profile view, we'll see, so here's the, the bridge, you know, we're looking at a profile of that across the river. Here is my new bridge structure. We can also view that fully in 3D view. So let me rotate over here. And here now is that newly um, modeled bridge across um, our river here. So sloping across a line, right, that is fairly um, intuitive to us. I drew a line and the feature created from it is given the slope that I specified. But I might want to do something a little bit more advanced and work in a perpendicular fashion to the line that I'm drawing. What we're going to do here is, is talk about, um, in this case, this is going to be used for road construction. So similar to where I mentioned um, about the ditch, although I'll be creating a, a berm or an embankment. Right, the curve of this road right along the edge of the river, uh, we need to model what a proposed embankment might look like um, you know, to keep you know, cars going too fast, I see conditions from driving off the road. So the first thing I want to do is to get a model of what an embankment of that nature might look like. So this is where I'm gonna use the option to create a slope across a line. So rather than the slope being uh, following the path of the line that I drew, like the bridge, it will be perpendicular to the line that I am drawing. So in this case, I want to make sure to set my slope appropriate for um, this process. So in this case, our embankment needs to be 15 degrees. If you ever need to work in percentages or ratios, you can do that. I'm going to feather this just a little more um, and we'll uh, keep our brush at about 10 pixels. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw my line right along the outside of the road. Uh, you know. I should have opened my 3D view first. We'll take a look at this in 3D afterwards. So I've, I've outlined roughly where I want that embankment to be, and now we'll see it created along the data set. Let me open 3D view and we'll see, let's dock it here. So we can see how that change takes place. So here is the length of that embankment, and let me undo what I did, and now keep an eye here where I've drawn that embankment, that 15 degree slope embankment along my data set when I reapply that. So we can see that embankment now all along the outer edge of that road. If I were to look at that in a profile, oh, wrong button. we'll be able to see now, so here is, this would be roadside, here's my embankment that I created, and then my slope down to the river on the outside of that. So a really easy and handy way to manipulate my terrain data um, and model it for whatever case um, I may need here. So if I had, again, if I had made that slope negative, I would have made a ditch just like somebody had, um, had asked about. It looks like you're making a racing circuit there, Jeff, with a right, bank. Yeah, corner. I don't know how fast you drive in that area, but nice, uh -huh. nice bank embankment there to get around that corner. Mm -hmm. a, a question about... Um, I guess the way that this works, actually a couple of questions. First one, are you creating a new terrain layer or are you modifying the existing layer? That's a kind of an easy one to answer. We're modifying here. This yeah. is actually changing the Z values dynamically. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there, isn't, there isn't a new layer being generated when you paint it, it. And obviously for that reason, it does require you to have uh, your your surface, your raster surface present. You can't you can't draw freehand with no no data there. You're modifying the yeah. Z values mm -hmm. uh, as part of that process. Also, Jeff, and I don't think we have a time. We're, we're going to run out of time here very quickly. But someone had asked about using uh, an existing polygon. You outlined the extent of that river manually, uh, yeah. either trace mode or, or, mm -hmm. or vertex mode. A question about whether you can do that if your polygon already exists, maybe a shape file that contains a polygon that you want to use as a the means to flatten an area. Uh, I'll just go ahead and answer that one very quickly. And again, if we had an extra hour here, we could go through a lot <laughs> more sure. tools. Um, but there is a tool in Gopa Mapper that will allow you to perform a cut and fill analysis based on a polygon. Um, mm -hmm. You can either define what that elevation is or have Global Mapper come up with a break-even height for flattening. Yeah. That's, a, that's a whole different workflow, but it effectively will do the same thing, um, but based on the presence or based on, on the fact that you already have that area defined. Mm -hmm. So,
Jeff, are you still there? David, are you still there? I'm still here. I think we lost both. We both both lost our audio for a while there. Oh, hi, hello. Um, <laughs> so that essentially wraps up what I wanted to show with um, terrain painting, David. So do you want to take a look maybe at some pixels to point stuff now? Yeah, sure. I know we're going. We may overshoot the top of the hour by just a little bit. Hopefully, this will not be too inconvenient. So yeah, we're moving down our list here. This is going to take just a few minutes to talk about pixels to points. Again, I want to very briefly talk about what that is first, and then show those of you who have used it in the past some of the new tools that are added in there. Jeff, if you get ready in a few minutes, I'm going to hand back over for one last look at maybe some of the 3D view saving for a quick demonstration of that. Sure. Um, so pixels to points is, is a component and somebody actually mentioned this not as a question but as a comment I mentioned at the start that you you know use drone images yeah you're right it doesn't have to be drone collected images it can be any photograph collected from a remote perspective or any any overlapping photographs I should specify uh, it could be aircraft quite difficult to get this sufficient overla overlap from an aircraft but it could also be and we've heard stories of people climbing a stepladder and taking photographs from multiple perspectives ultimately what you you have as a raw material are individual photographs I'll just show one of these very quickly here, using my info tool, I'll get the wrong tool selected. Let me try that one more time. Let me use my info tool, and you can see that photograph, and I can actually cycle through here. I believe it will let me, if I use my arrow button, cycle through. And you can see these are individual photographs, uh, multiple perspectives of a defined target area. I'm not gonna go into the technical details, but as an output of the analysis, the pixels to points analysis, we reconstruct this area in 3D. We generate a point cloud, we generate a 3D mesh or 3D model, and as a byproduct, we can also generate an ortho image. That's a very quick and, and hasty overview of what this tool does. Um, I'm gonna go back to what I said earlier. If you have a drone, you will want to take a look at this. Uh, go ahead and grab a trial, throw some of your drone images in and uh, follow the procedure to, to create your 3D environment. I'll show you the, the final product in just a few minutes. But quickly looking at some of the new tools that have been added in here, um, uh, with apologies for not kind of describing in detail, let me go ahead first of all and load the image points that I have on my screen here. Uh, let's load my picture points. And um, we'll see a list of the individual images here as well. This is where we process them. This is where we define ground control, et cetera, et cetera, um, beyond the scope of our, our the time available today. Specifically, what we have added here are a couple of tools that will um, effectively allow you to manage the uh, kind of the process of creating the data. Um, one which is very useful is the option right in here to allow you to restart a canceled operation. Now the operation can take some time. I ran through this procedure um, uh, a couple of days ago and it took a couple of hours for these these images to process and my machine is not the highest end machine it took a couple of hours if you find yourself having to cancel that um, previously you would have to restart now we have an option to, for you to set up a an allocated block of memory that will it will save the procedure up to that point and if you run it again with the same photos it will say oh i see you've started this you want to pick up where you left off you can continue now this will allow you at the end of the day oh i don't have time this evening to complete this put it on pause come back the next morning and pick up where you left off very useful for that purpose also we have enabled the, the idea of clustering um if you have uh, if your your specifications in your machine are, are for, on the low end, you may find a message will pop up saying you may run out of memory, recommending that you reduce the image size by a specific factor or over a certain factor. Uh, that's one way to uh, allow this process to be run on lower end machines. Um, another option now is this clustering option where we essentially segment your photographs up into batches and do those batches individually, breaking down a large group of photographs, maybe. 300 photographs into more manageable chunks and go through the, each of those sequentially and then ultimately at the end generating one output. So clustering again is a workflow optimization tool that was added in the latest uh, latest build of this uh, of the uh, pixels to point dialog box. Other uh, option here, if we select an image, we can right click. Now we have an option to so show the metadata for that image. So this is obviously just one selected image, a drone collected image, and we can now at an image level see all of the particulars for that one image. You'll notice all of the uh, camera parameters noted in here. If you want to want to do a quick check on that image, maybe this is an image that doesn't look right as far as the alignment with the others. You can quickly check how it was captured, and if you need, you can uncheck and it will not be considered for the analysis. You can remove that one from the list. 
Um, another enhancement that has been added, and this is an interesting one as well, um, from the file menu, we've added an option to manage cameras. Now, when we first rolled this tool out several years ago, uh, we pre-baked in what we knew at the time were the available cameras, and inevitably people would encounter situations where their camera was not in that database, and they'll have to manually enter those parameters. Uh, we've expanded that now, so we're, we're confident that most of the cameras that you'll be using are actually pre-formatted, but you can add additional cameras and indeed you can edit some of those camera parameters as well you'll see the uh, list here noting all those cameras in fact if you're out shopping for a, a new camera you may want to check does uh, the pixels to points tool support it this is a very very long list you can also opt only to display any custom cameras you've added you've got, there's a few I've added in here based on some data that I was working with and this Help Scoba Mapper in the processing by defining the sensor width and fo focal length, and you can edit any of those parameters as needed. So this is kind of a little window into the the camera, li the list of supported cameras, and indeed any additional camera uh, cameras that you add to that disk, uh, that uh, um, uh, list. Um, other things that have been improved, I'm not going to show this right now, but we've also improved the reporting of this process. Uh, with the last release, we uh, introduced a tool for um, uh, generating an HTML file that give a very detailed report as to the quality of the output, give you a snapshot preview of what the output looks like, um, allowing you to submit that perhaps in a report to a client saying this is what we got from your data. Um, that has been improved, it's been structured a little bit better, there's a table of contents now. Um, that is a file that will be generated uh, when you run that output, you can simply share that with, a, uh, with anyone that's needed. So I'm gonna pretend I've actually run the process just for those of you who have never seen this before and show you what we get very quickly here. Um, what we output is a global mapper package file. That package file contains my point cloud. This is similar to LiDAR, but it's not LiDAR. We generate as a byproduct an ortho image. Now, if this ortho image is a rasterized version of your point cloud, effectively an image in which every pixel is correct in two-dimensional space. It has been modified and corrected to accommodate variations in terrain, so it is a more accurate representation of this area than simply your standard, uh, you know, photo, the initial photographs. It has corrected some of this distortion in those photographs. And the final output, which is the eye candy, is our mesh. Now the mesh is a vector file. You'll note the individual triangles that uh, comprise this vector file are only visible when you zoom in a little closer. But to bring this to the full effect, I want to pop up my 3D view and hopefully we'll see what we're able to generate. Now, we obviously didn't go through the detailed steps. If you want to see how that works, look at some of our previous presentations. But this, again, for those of you who have never seen this before, is what you're able to generate with drone or indeed any other remotely captured photographs that have sufficient overlap. And that is the requirement for this tool. So a few new additions to pixels to points uh, was, uh, were added in version 22.1. Jeff, do you have time to show us a little bit about uh, some of the new 3D saving options? Yes, I think we can do that pretty we can quick. Squeeze it in. Why don't we do that? Let's go ahead and okay. share the screen back over to Jeff one more time. Okay, so uh, let's pop open 3D view here. Um, whenever we open 3D view, it will default to the perspective um, similar to where we have our 2D view. You'll notice I have my 2D and 3D view linked, so if I move 2D view, 3D view, and update. Anyway, we now have a variety of saved views in 3D along with the ability to save custom views. So from my view menu, I can choose any of the cardinal directions as my starting perspective. So perhaps I want to start in the east and look to the west. So let me pop up my perspective here. So now I am on the east side of my data looking off to the west and you could do that for any cardinal direction maybe i want to look from the north and look to south more importantly i can choose to save perspectives so i saved a perspective just before for the new bridge that we made earlier here is that bridge so i can quickly navigate to things that i have created in my 3d or 2d space and, and move between them quickly I also have the ability to save a new perspective. So maybe I want to take a look at this very initial site that I flattened. Maybe I'll choose to save a new view and we'll call it flattened site. That will now zoom out from it. That will now exist in my list. These are all saved with my workspace. 
So I can zoom right back to that and I can manage all those views as well. So we'll see I have all the custom 3D views I've made. I could choose one and navigate to it or perhaps um, maybe delete it. Maybe I don't need that flattened site any longer. As a quick little segue here, uh, we can do the same thing in 2D view, which has actually existed longer in 2D view. So if I wanted from 2D view, I could go and see any of my saved views. So maybe I wanna go look at this apartment complex. I can zoom there. I can also, you know, if I wanna look at that with the LiDAR data actually, um, and I could choose to, to save uh, any new views from 2D view as well. So great ways to, to spatially save a certain viewer perspective, new to 3D view, but also exists in 2D view as well. Excellent, thank you, Jeff. So again, that, that tool that I think was worthwhile noting kind of as a, uh, a, a final quick demo yeah. uh, mm -hmm. because it's relative or relevant, again, I should say, to, to working with LiDAR data. Those, mm -hmm. those pre-assigned 3D views also, I think, even more useful as ability to save your own. Lots of questions today. I, Jeff, I think this is the most questions we've ever had. I'm gonna go through a couple yeah. here very quickly before we wrap up. Uh, uh, does Pixels to Point work with oblique photos? Absolutely, in fact, for the types of applications that I was looking at for buildings, you definitely will want your photographs to be a little more oblique. It will work exactly the same way. So the answer to that is yes. Um, does the relative altitude in the image file represent above ground or an altitude relative to the takeoff? That is an absolute elevation that's written to the EXIF data. There is a setting in pixels to point to define what that ground elevation is at your takeoff point. That helps to improve the accuracy um, mm -hmm. if you don't have ground control where you've surveyed the ground. So, but it is the embedded data is going to be an absolute value that's assigned. And it's based on the knowledge of where the, the drone or the camera was located that we're able to determine the 3D characteristics of the target environment. Uh, someone asked if we've in, ever used, I, it says internal scan data. I assume it means uh, scan data from inside a building, absolutely. Global, the LiDAR module will work with any type of point cloud, uh, regardless of its source. So the name LiDAR is a little bit of a misnomer, but it, it will work with uh, with any uh, any type of point cloud data. Folks, if we didn't have a chance to answer your questions, and again, there are there are dozens and dozens that I'm looking through here, mm -hmm. we will follow up with you directly. We'll also po post the questions and answers on a blog, so you can see what everyone else has been asking, and we'll, we'll, we'll share that with you a little bit later. The final bullet here, I'm just gonna quickly note here, uh, new default point view settings. There's a configuration option that allows you to determine the initial characteristics. I'm not gonna show it to you, but if you go to configuration, there's a LiDAR section, you can determine things like the default point size for a point cloud. That has been added new uh, in version 22.1. So hopefully today we whetted your appetite a little bit, uh, showing you some of the recent additions, but also introducing you to some of those enhancements. I certainly think in my, from my perspective, the new building regularization is a major new development. Uh, if you are interested in, in generating your building footprints from, from that classified data, what's your favorite tool in the latest release, Jeff? Sorry, putting you on the spot. Uh, oh, I, I uh, big fan of some of the new terrain painting things and how they can let us really get hands on with manipulating our terrain data. Yeah, a lot of people love the terrain yeah. painting. They feel like mm -hmm. they're 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 creating a whole new world for right. themselves. And it's just such an easy way to to model that quickly for you know whatever whatever use case you need really. Absolutely, absolutely, very powerful tool indeed. So the development continues. We will continue to share updated information as we add new functionality to the lidar module. So all we have time for today. Thank you so much again for taking your time to join us today. Uh, if you want to recap some of these workflows, uh, this recording again will be available shortly. Look out for an email. Um, if you're watching the recording of this and didn't attend the live event, you'll notice a couple of emails here. Feel free to use those to ask any questions. Orders at bluemarblegeo.com is uh, where you'll want to ask questions about licensing. Um, I did mention earlier about the trial option for enabling the LiDAR module on a temporary basis, but if you want to enable it more permanently, uh, contact the folks at Orders and we can get, let you know the particulars of how that works. If you've got a, if you want to apply it to a network license or we have dongle licensing, et cetera, please feel free to send an email to the folks in our sales department. GeoHelp um, is where you'll want to ask those technical questions. The workflows uh, that we went through today, if you have any specific questions about some of those procedures or any of the tools in the application, the folks uh, in our tech crew are more than happy to help you with those. And if you're one of the 34% who are not using the LiDAR module or maybe not using Global Mapper, go to our website, bluemarblegeo.com. You can grab the software today. You can grab version 22.1, install it. Again, set up your trial and maybe 
try to go through some of the workflows we covered. Jeff, thank you so much for your help today. Thanks for lending your expertise. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, David. It's always fun. Yeah, indeed. And folks, we will talk to you next month, or next week, I'm sorry, when we talk about 3D coordinate systems. Have a great day, folks.